uh, doing things that I wasn't that excited about. So then I applied to graduate school, also in chemical <laughs> engineering, and uh, came across a, a group, a Christy Ansess group at the University of Colorado, uh, working on biomaterials. Uh, and so that got me really excited about uh, biomedical applications of material science. Uh, and then I did a postdoc at MIT for uh, about two and a half years, working more on the translational aspects, so clinical models where biomaterials can be uh, implanted. Uh, and then came to Penn in 2005, so I, I think I might be the senior faculty member on this list. Um, and so I've been here since then uh, with a lab that focuses mostly on soft materials, um, hydrogels for applications. A lot of it's on mechanobiology, um, also applications in cardiovascular and musculoskeletal tissue repair. Um, and hello again to watch you exist there yesterday to give seminar, uh, and so maybe I met some of you uh, during that visit. So. All right, hi everyone, and hello. Um, so I am Milika Lakadamiala. I am in the physiology department here at UPenn. I'm an assistant professor. Um, so I did my training. So I got my bachelor's degree in physics uh, from the University of Texas at Austin. Um, I think it was at that time that I uh, started sort of exploring what I wanted to do with my life, and I got interested in um, science and research, so I did an undergraduate um, thesis on um, using atomic force microscopy to um, image and um, mechanically <laughs> flow, uh, neuronal growth cones. So that was sort of my um, you know, entry into um, biophysics and um, you know, applications of my physics training to more sort of biologically oriented questions, which I really loved. Um, so then I applied for graduate school and I went to do my PhD at uh, Harvard, um, continuing in that trajectory. So again, while my PhD was in physics, um, my research was uh, more and more biophysical. So I worked in the lab of Xiaowei Zhuang, um, got uh, training in um, microscopy, um, high resolution, single molecule imaging techniques and applying those to understand how viruses enter and infect uh, cells at the single virus level. Um, and then for my postdoc, I stayed at Harvard. I kind of moved across the street uh, to um, uh, Jeff Littman's lab. Um, and again, uh, applying some of these microscopy methods to understanding neuronal circuitry in the brain. Um, and from there, um, I um, got my first position as an independent investigator in Europe, actually. So I went to Spain, to Barcelona, um, to a research institute, um, Institute of Photonic Sciences. In 2010, I was there for about seven years um, before I relocated here to UPenn. Uh, again, following this sort of uh, trajectory and um, interest in being more and more biologically oriented and having interest in being in an environment where, um, you know, I have more interactions with people doing uh, more biology. So that's me. <laughs> Murat, do you want to uh, Hello, everyone. Uh, my, yeah, my name is Murat, and thank you for the introduction, too. Uh, so uh, I uh, got uh, both of my uh, BS and MS degrees uh, in a you know, relatively uh, different field, more, um, metallurgical and materials engineering uh, from Turkey, but our school was very much focused on metallurgy. Um, and I, I was working with uh, like powder, uh, metal powders for hydrogen storage for like energy applications uh, during my master's. Um, but then uh, while I was working on my master's, I, uh, and you know, because of my background in materials engineering too, I was very fascinated with biomimetic uh, design, material design. And, uh, and I, I was also uh, getting into uh, soft materials, more like polymers as com compared with the, with the metal powders. So uh, I decided to do my PhD on uh, biomimetic materials and I uh, wanted to continue materials engineering. So I went to uh, Northwestern. So I started in 2007. Um, I work with Ken Shaw. Uh, he's working on polymers and hydrogels and uh, pressure sensitive adhesives. And during that time, I was uh, able to uh, develop this um, hydrogel where we had a, a, a peptide that's from the marine muscle. So we developed this marine muscle adhesive uh, hydrogels, which can work in, in water and get high adhesive strength. Um, 
and and after that, uh, I joined to uh, UPenn as a, a postdoc. Uh, I did a, a short uh, postdoc in material science and engineering, uh, but during that time, um, and I was working with Shu Yang, and she was a junior faculty at that time. But a year before, I actually had met with Jason in Chicago in a SFP conference. That was my first time actually going to that conference. And then we had been talking about, you know, like me joining maybe in his lab. Uh, and then when I was there in the materials um, uh, department, we actually started a joint project with Shu Yang and Jason. Then it turned into uh, more like me working in his lab as a full time. Uh, because I was more interested in the bio side of the things. I think it seems like all of us has similar um, kind of an interest that we, we end up doing some biology. So I start working with stem cells uh, in Jason's lab and trying to develop some uh, novel um, polymeric systems uh, using material properties to control stem cell behavior and differentiation. Um, and after I uh, was done with my postdoc, uh, I did a um, I kind of prepared myself, I guess, for the academic position. I did a, a three-year research assistant uh, professor position uh, at Rutgers uh, in, in a center um, called uh, New Jersey Center for Biomaterials. Um, and afterwards, I joined, uh, in 2016, I joined NJIT as, a, as an assistant professor uh, in chemical and materials engineering department. Um, and currently, uh, my lab, kind of like combine all my background from uh, all the way from from the bachelor's degree to, to PhD. We are working on uh, polymers, uh, polymer composites, uh, and also hydrogels uh, for tissue engineering applications and for processing technique, we are doing additive manufacturing, including bioprinting in my lab at the moment. Hi, so I'm Lucia Strader. I'm an associate professor at WashU. And um, I think my background's quite a bit different from a lot of the other people. I grew up in a very, very rural part of Louisiana. I'm a first generation high school graduate. Um, and then I majored in agronomy at LSU as an undergraduate. For those of you who don't know, agronomy is basically farming. So my classes consisted of going out into the field and adjusting sprayer nozzles to get the right amount of pesticide and field applications and those sorts of things. But I came very fascinated with how plants worked. And so I did my PhD at Washington State University in Pullman, Washington. Um, again, in a crop and science department, but a little bit more molecular. Um, became more fascinated with the molecular side of things and then moved to Rice University in Houston, Texas to work for Bonnie Bartel and my postdoc where um, really I was introduced to a lot of biochemistry and molecular genetics. Um, and so when I started my own lab here at WashU, I've become more and more and more um, molecular and interested in how uh, biophysics affects different biological processes, um, mostly using plants as a model to understand. <laughs> okay. okay, okay, great. So I'm, I'm Nate, I'm uh, just, uh, just about in my second year as an assistant professor at WashU. I started off, um, undergraduate as a, a pre-med and I took a, a freshman seminar course about surgical materials and this got me really interested in biomaterials so um, I did research as an undergraduate with Kevin Healy and this I continued being interested so I, I went and did my PhD with uh, Dave Mooney at Harvard um, working on how gel mechanics regulates uh, mesenchymal sulfate. Um, during this time, I got um, interested in uh, gaining more of a molecular tool set, um, largely feeling a, a little bit limited in the types of questions I could ask without that. Uh, so I went and did a, a, a postdoc in um, uh, I, IPS cell and molecular biology at the Gladstone Institute with Bruce Conklin. And um, it, was, it was very interesting. I, I did find myself going a little bit too far down the rabbit hole of molecular biology. And so um, I went back with uh, Kevin for about a year and a half as a senior scientist working on um, heart on a chip platforms uh, to be able to take some of what I'd learned about IPS cells and molecular biology and then leverage it towards uh, mechanobiologic questions uh, in the heart. 
Uh, my lab here, we do some things with um, engineered heart muscle, looking at how mechanical cues affect that, um, and we do some uh, basic hydrogel development. Is Javon here? No, I don't believe she was to me good. Okay. okay. Um, I mean, if there are already questions from like students and trainees, I think um, you can just go ahead and ask a question. Otherwise, we also have a lot of questions that were already submitted um, before this meeting. So I don't know. I can ask the pen people to ask the question. Temple. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, we can ask questions for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. All right, cool. Um, so one of the things that I guess is always on that it seems like uh, postdoc positions are uh, variable in the time it's spent there doing research in your lab. Some people do it for two years, three, and four, four. How do you guys usually know when? time to move on and start your lab or I know it's also based on availability of positions and when you get it but I don't know is there like a time when you know when you're uh, ready and have Nate answering this first since he's pretty new um, I don't think I don't think you <clears throat> You really know when you're ready. You, I think, gen generally, you you want to you want to have good publications out of your postdoc. The the nature of the work you're doing is probably going to be the biggest factor in determining the the length of it. Um, I would say that if you're if you're not really sure that you really want an academic job, then then don't get into it. Um, um, so maybe, maybe if, if part of the postdoc is figuring out how sure you are, then take your time and make sure that you're that this is what you really want to do. Um, and if you're if you're like me and you're one of those people, maybe you you want to you want the time to go faster in the postdoc because you already know what you want and you're. Um, part of it is gaining skills, I would say that it's strategize and have at least one project that you're doing uh, where you're very confident that you can make it quickly, even if it won't be a nature paper, and then keep that high risk, high reward thing cooking in the background. Thank you. Yes. Oh. Yeah. I've got lots of thoughts. I can, yeah, I have thoughts too that I can contribute. Go, but go, go. ahead. <laughs> well, this is strange for me because many of my postdocs are in this room. <laughs> and Marat's a former postdoc who's uh, <laughs> online as well. But um, I think it's um, I think a lot of it's thinking about, you know, why what do you want to get out of your postdoc and what are your goals maybe for the next stage of what you want to do. Um, and so if you're there, uh, as Nate said, just to learn a, a skill set, maybe a shorter postdoc is okay. Um, if you really want to build a, a new breadth of uh, information and training uh, towards an academic career, and that's really important to, to build that expertise, then I think a longer postdoc um, uh, can be good. I think a postdoc's a, a really fun time. There's, it's a really flexible what you work on. Um, and so often I find postdocs um, are less anxious to move on, I guess. Um, but I've got a, a few examples where, you know, maybe the, the perfect faculty position opens up. Um, so I had one, one postdoc, Will Gramlich, um, who really wanted to go back to the University of Maine, and um, apparently they only open up a position every few years. And so one had opened up, and so he did a shorter postdoc than he had intended because this op it was the opportunity uh, that kind of opened up. Um, and I would say different fields, maybe, you can comment on this, but different fields, maybe uh, there's different lengths of postdocs that are maybe expected before you apply. So, um, so again, yeah, I think I fully agree that it depends on your end goal. Um, so if the end goal is a faculty position, an academic position, uh, given how competitive 
um, you know, getting these positions are these days, you of course want a very strong CV with, you know, um, publications. Um, I am on the faculty search committee at the moment, actually, for our department, and, you know, it's amazing to see, you know, the applicants and the, uh, you know, I, I, I sometimes think back, I applied in 2010, and I think, okay, I wouldn't be competitive in this, in this market. Um, so, so, you know, uh, these, these places are getting very strong applicants with very strong CVs, so building that up, I think. Um, if that's your end goal, is an important part of your postdoc. Um, and also developing the ideas for, um, you know, what you would be pursuing in your independent lab, um, you know, um, um, and, and um, you know, being in a position where you can write a proposal that's going to excite people, I think, is uh, uh, rather important. So if you think you're at that point uh, two or three years into your training, um, by all means, go for it. Um, uh, usually, uh, it can take longer than that. Now, that being said, uh, if I look back to my own career, actually, so I did not follow any of these things that I just said. Um, so I went from being a biophysicist to into a neuroscience lab uh, for my postdoc, excited about applying my biophysics training to, you know, looking at uh, brain circuitry in mice. <laughs> and I went into a lab where the average time for a postdoc was 10 years. Um, and, um, um, you know, maybe I was um, just sort of naive thinking, oh, you know, I can get out uh, in a shorter time period, but it uh, became pretty quickly clear to me that if I wanted to really, you know, um, put in the work to publish a very high impact paper, I would have to stay there um, for that period of time. And it wasn't guaranteed that I could in the end end up with probably no publication at all. So I, I decided that was not for me, and I left after uh, three years. Um, in fact, at the time that I applied for my position, I didn't have a paper from my postdoc. And um, you know, again, I don't recommend that everybody does that. Um, but it worked out for me. Um, and um, you know, the other advice that I can give is that perhaps I was um, you know, um, lucky because um, I was in the right place at the right time. Super resolution microscopy but was just being, you know, developed at the time, and I was um, there to capitalize on that and sort of differentiate myself and get a unique sort of um, niche that, you know, very few people had that um, at the time, um, and that really helped me in my job search. So, um, you know, places were really looking to be early adopters of these technologies and looking for people who really could really, you know, bring the expertise in, um, and, and that, that helped a lot. So finding something that is very unique um, uh, and exciting technology could be a useful way of going about that as well. Is there any other, Lucia or Murat? Yeah, I think um, everyone made really great points. I do have one comment. I don't think you're ever ready for what <laughs> entails. Um, there's so many aspects to this job that postdoctoral training doesn't prepare you for. You're basically running a small business, right? You have to manage people, you have to manage accounts. And so um, there's a scientific readiness, but there's also the readiness for all the aspects of the job that you get shielded from as a postdoc as well. So um, when uh, when you start your new position and you feel over your head, just realize that that is uh, completely normal. <laughs> so maybe um, I think I can say a couple words too if we have time. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so uh, when I actually consider my my postdoc experience, mine was uh, what everybody was already mentioning that you know, I needed to learn some new skills, so mine was much longer. And I didn't do anything about, you know, I didn't know anything about cells or stem cells or you know, like media, culture, anything like that. So I was working with literally like graduate students that are showing me how to do those things, so it take a long time. So I think it really depends on, as everybody was mentioning, like what, what are you expecting from the postdoc position? And if there are new skills, it is better to stay. But I think another very important thing is, I, I can relate this to um, 
to kind of like butterflies, right? So you are you are an egg, you become a caterpillar, you kind of like crawl in the grass and all that stuff. People can step on you, all that things. But then when you become a butterfly, you have a very short amount of li life uh, cycle, right? So I think <laughs> when you really grasp everything and you can publish very good papers. So one thing that you really want to make sure that is you don't want to miss that that opportunity to become a butterfly. So you can leave the group while you're a caterpillar and then that papers, you know, you're going to be missing those. Um, and and it's very different when you start your own lab uh, to, to publish a very high impact paper might take years <coughs> and you're never going to be able to publish. So you should definitely, you know, uh, take that. Of course, it also depends who, which lab you are working on. So if the lab has a good uh, track record of publishing like good uh, journals, um, I think it's very important uh, to, and the second thing is, you know, like also depending on how active the, the advisor is, uh, to learn about grant writing and uh, and also the um, the funding sources, uh, like what what are the funding funding sources that you your advisor is applying, and then maybe like you start learning about those things. But I think the most important thing is yeah, that that small window of opportunity where you can publish very high impact papers are generally like you know the kind of towards the end of your postdoc, and you should stay and you know collect all these before you leave. I think that's, that's it from me. Does it, can I ask the next question? Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, did you consider non-academia for any amount of time or did you ever like turn out in this city or um, to any other career path and like, why make your decision? Sure. Yeah, so, um, you know, when I was in my postdoc and I realized, you know, I had to stay there for 10 years to publish a paper, I did briefly consider alternative paths. Um, and I did even interview for some inter uh, industry positions. And when I went through that process, that made me realize that that was not for me. Um, so then I went back to my, you know, first plan of, you know, following an academic path. And I thought, okay, I will apply for jobs if I don't get anything. You know, then I, you know, I give up, but I, I really felt like I have to try um, uh, because when I uh, went and interviewed for these industry positions and, you know, looking at sort of um, these um, short term projects that somebody would impose on me and if it didn't deliver in a given amount of time, I would have to give up. So my academic training was not really like compatible with that mindset and I realized I wouldn't be very happy doing that. Um, um, so yeah, um, that was that was my my uh, experience. Uh, I can also say a couple words, if, if I may. Yes. Okay. I, I, I guess I mean this is this is a very viable uh, option for, uh, for like, uh, I mean someone like me because I was in the academy for a very long time too, and I think there's also this window that you know if you are a little bit in the older age, um, so the universities have a different perspective on you. So. I was worried about that, and and when I was a postdoc in Jason's lab, I did actually have a couple interviews. Maybe he will remember that too. And um, and and to to be honest with you, I mean, uh, I really uh, understand what like uh, and in here what uh, Medica is saying. So then, usually, like when you work in a in an in an industry uh, or, or uh, the, the the idea is, you know, like whatever the company, if they change their um, uh, product line or what they are interested, uh, they, you may be switching what you are working on. So it's not like you are working on what you are passionate about. Um, but on the other hand, you know, like many of my uh, friends uh, from Northwestern uh, that we graduated together, I think I can say it's like almost 50-50. Some of them went to academy, they are, they are incredibly uh, successful right now. And then some of them are now in, in uh, some of the top companies, but they have their own research labs. So which means like they are the head of that group and they hire, fire, they have almost like my, my research lab. Uh, they have their research lab. The only thing is right now, for example, I am kind of uh, 
my research is really determined on where I can get the grant, if it is NSF or NIH. So it's not like necessarily I can really do what I exactly want, because if I can't get the grant, you know, I can't really do that anyways. And in their case, they do exactly the same thing, but whatever the company company's goals are. Uh, and the only difference between us is, you know, like uh, they could they could be living in million dollar houses right now, and it might take me maybe <laughs> ten years to get into that level. Uh, but 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 I think like my perspective, you shouldn't necessarily like kick it completely because there are positions that you can excel and then become like a, your own. You can have your own group. And the best way to look at it is basically if you go for an for an interview, you have to ask for their career paths. So if if I get this job, what would be my career path in the future? In the future, and I think in my case, I was a little bit lucky because uh, I don't know if it is lucky or not. But I when I was in Jason's group, I think it was the fourth year or fifth year, I got an offer uh, uh, from a from a company, and it was um, it was a it was a pharmaceutical company. It was like a very nice position. Um, and I think the name was Sharing Pla. I can say it. I think there's nothing. Uh, but and, and the funny story is, you know, like they 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 give me the offer, and I was very much inclined to go. Uh, and I think maybe Jason will remember this. I'm not 100 percent sure about that. But then, you know, like I took all the group members out, so we celebrated. Uh, this is like I I got the phone call on Friday, and then and I took everyone out on Friday evening, and then Saturday evening I took like because my wife is was on also on the uh, pen too so i took her group out we took so we were celebrating it was great uh, then monday morning before come before getting into my bike to come to school i was looking at the news and i heard that you know oh merck uh, uh, was uh, joining with sharing Pla, so they are merging and and apparently the merger happened and my offer went to hay so i couldn't Get the offer because oh everything was goodness. frozen, uh, and then I end up being, uh, you know, uh, in the academy. So, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm I'm very happy actually. But the thing is, like the the friend that I'm one of the friends that I'm talking about, like she was in the chemical engineering at Northwestern, uh, and she we were both interning at the same time. The only difference between us is I was international, so they had to go through all this H1 and stuff. Uh, and they didn't want to do that because of that merger. But in her case, uh, because she was a U.S. citizen, they immediately hired her before the merger happened. Uh, and and right now, like this, uh, she she's in Merck and she has her own 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 group, uh, and she's in a very high up top. So you know, you never know. But I'm very happy where am I right now. Uh, but I can say she's very happy where she is too. Yeah, so I mean, I think overall, I wasn't trying to suggest that everyone should become an academic, but you should do what makes you happy, right? And, in, you know, in my case, I realized that, you know, being an academic is what makes me happy. And I guess you realize that too. And perhaps if I went the alternative path, um, despite my skepticism, I might have ended up liking it as well. I, I can't do that experiment, so I don't know. But um, yeah, follow your passion. Um, and if academics is something you're passionate about, uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, perhaps don't give up on it um, easily. Right. Um, and there's something I mean, else going is, back. I'm sorry, yeah. it is definitely worth waiting, and we don't necessarily do this for money anyways, right? Or else nobody will be in academy. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's, it's really much of our, our, our like what we really like and what we want to do. Um, so... I definitely agree with you in that sense. <laughs> Talk a little bit about the period earlier than a postdoc. So if you have a graduate student and the graduate student is not sure what to do, what do you tell your graduate or what graduate student figure this out? I can start. Um, yeah, you know, I think um, hopefully everyone has mentors that are very open to different paths. Um, I think all the programs that we're talking about, uh, there's many paths that we can go down, our grad students can go down um, after uh, getting their PhD. Um, so uh, hopefully those from my lab will, will agree. But, um, you know, I think I usually just try to explore throughout the process. You know, some PhD students will come in thinking, oh, I know I want to go into academics. And some of those have changed their mind along the way. Um, the reverse is 
is like me, I didn't even consider academics and then kind of evolved that uh, concept along the way. Um, so my, I think I'd, I'd say the biggest advice I can give is that uh, uh, explore the options by talking to people in those positions. Um, I've never worked in industry, so I'm not a great resource to tell you what it's like to be in industry. Uh, but I've had a number of students now go into industry. So usually uh, I'll have PhD students and I'll encourage them to talk to some of my previous trainees. Um, or it could be through a program like this where there's trainees who have gone and done different things. Uh, and just explore through interacting with those in those positions about what those might be like. Um, whether it's industry, we've had uh, trainees go into the FDA, um, those into more consulting. Uh, so all of these different paths, but unless you talk to people in those careers, you won't really know much about what it's like. Uh, and I can only tell you what it's like to be a faculty member from personal experience, at least. So uh, I know, Nate, you just started your lab, but I guess, um, do you have any advice for any of your students or future students about this? Um, I mean, just based on the numbers, most of the people that are in training positions right now are going into industry, right? The, um, and there's a wide variety of experiences you can have in industry. You can be at a startup where it's kind of like an academic lab where you're breaking new ground all the time. You can be at a very established company. Um, even within the established company, you could be on the product development side where it's lower risk. Um, so it, there, there's the ability to do the type of research you like in in the industrial setting. Um, be like like Jason, my experience has been in academic. So I I try to give them opportunities to talk to people from industry because um, they know more about their job than I do. Um, but I, I think it's it, it, it is important to keep keep an open mind. Some people in academia have very strong opinions about industry and vice versa. And um, like anything else, if you only listen to a small number of people, you're going to tend to be biased towards the most opinionated ones. So talk to, you know, tell them talk to as many people as you can. Um, big conferences can be a pretty good place to meet up and network with people from industry. But yeah. Great. Are there any questions from the trainees? Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah. What do you like about being a professor? Because uh, it sure seems like it sucks sometimes. So. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to start? <laughs> Rob, do you want to start? <laughs> <laughs> so I think the 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 two even even as a second year assistant professor I can say it's really cool to see someone that came in with no background at all accomplish something that literally hasn't been accomplished before and as a faculty member you get to see that a lot of course you see all the times it didn't work but you there, there's no other setting where you're going to see from nothing um, really new, cool things happening. And at the same time, people uh, developing um, from a very low level of experience to a very high level of expertise. And that's, that's rewarding to get to see that. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's sort of like the wonder of discovery, right? I mean, you know, seeing uh, something develop from an idea into, you know, like a really cool project, cool story. Of course, there are a lot of, you know, winding roads along the way. But finally, when everything comes together, or even like uh, in the very beginning, uh, just an observation, we do microscopy a lot. So if a student comes to me with this cool image, cool data that no one has ever looked at before, I mean, that's sort of like are the times when I'm like, oh, yeah, I love this job. Um, this is why I'm doing it. So that that wonder, uh, that curiosity and, and being able to go after, you know, things that 
people haven't thought about before, haven't seen before. Uh, for me, that's the most exciting part of my job. And, and seeing, yeah, seeing trainees develop into yeah. a scientist. Um, so yeah, come into the lab, um, completely naive, completely open, and then just sort of, you know, um, uh, see them slowly evolve into being able to design their own experiments, their own uh, ideas, and follow it through. I think it's another very satisfying part of my job. Yeah, I, I usually say there's kind of two main things that, um, that you have to like if you want to go into academics, and um, or I guess in contrast to other, other types of positions. So one is generating new ideas. Mm -hmm. so, you, so you have to like the goal of coming up with an idea. I mean, we can work on whatever we want mm -hmm. in academics. Uh, we have to convince someone to give us money to do it. <laughs> um, so that's, that's part of it. Uh, whereas in industry, it's guided a little bit more for you. Um, there's projects that you're probably working on that are decided upon for other reasons um, rather than just uh, intellectual interest. Um, and so it depends on the industry, I think, uh, of what that's like. But the contrast is we can work on whatever we want. Um, and then enjoying the training part of it, you know, which I think was already mentioned. So um, if you don't like to mentor and train students, um, you won't enjoy being in academics. And it's not just teaching in the classroom. I think it's definitely in, in the lab. And you'll do that in industry, but I think it's at a time, it's at a different time of growth in the trainees um, development uh, that's different than when you run your own research lab. Um, and uh, so I think those are things that you have to really like. So, um, and if you really like those things, I think then the, the bad things you hear about academics, you know, are minor, you know, they're, they're part of the job. Morat, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, I, I agree with, uh, with 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 all 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 the things that everybody said, but I think uh, I can also directly say a couple things too, which is fun things. So when you start, you know, they give you a good amount of money, and then <laughs> good amount of space, uh, and you know, couple students. Uh, so you can actually get some good students. And the cool thing is, you know, you have all this money. You can buy all these instruments that you want. You know, like decorate your lab. Uh, whatever. So it's, it's fun, you know, like you almost like you start your, like if you're interested in industry, for example, you start your own business. It's like a business really uh, oh, in goodness. one sense, because, because then what you need to do is they give you all this stuff. You are very happy. You spend all these things, but then after third year, all your money is gone. And now then, you know, like uh, you really need to be very creative, generate ideas, but then you need to convince, uh, you know, federal government or companies uh, to fund you. Uh, and, and you know, I think it's fun. I like that stuff. Uh, and and the other thing is, as Jason and others mentioned, you know, training. Um, but I mean, I like the teaching part of it too. So if you have some ideas, for example, like I developed the editor manufacturing course for both undergrads and grads. Uh, and when I have a very uh, you know difficult problem that I couldn't solve in my lab, I have 30 students every year taking my class. So I gave them as a project. And then like, <laughs> they try to come up with a solution. So I, I'm kind of cheating in that sense. But but on the other hand, you know, like we also have programs for high school students, like teachers, uh, graduate stu uh, undergraduate students. Like during the summer, my lab. I mean, if you come to my lab and see, it's fun. Like we have we have high school students, teachers, uh, and undergrads with with my own lab. So I have like sometimes 15 people. Um, you know, doing some parts of research, and 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 we are affecting uh, in a better way to their lives, especially for like high school students and undergraduate students towards you know training them. But I definitely agree uh, with Jason. So if you don't like to interact uh, with students or uh, like training them and not just teaching, it's difficult because there are faculty like this, and it's pain for the students too. Uh, so I think maybe you should be considering something else, but I think that's, a, that's an important part uh, that you need to be able to interact with students and uh, from all levels and to be able to, you know, like train them. Um, but I but I really like that part of it too. Oh, can I ask so um, Maliki, you're from the School of Medicine is your appointment and for uh, the rest of you, I think you're in engineering, right, in engineering departments. And so you guys mentioned a little bit about the teaching as something that you like to do. But what, I guess, are your teaching loads? And then kind of related to that, um, being in from different schools, I guess, like 
what percentage of your pay is soft money versus hard money from that teaching? Yes. Well, um, in, the, in the School of Medicine, of course, it's predominantly soft mm -hmm. money, right? So 70% um, soft money. Um, and my teaching load is pretty light compared to being mm -hmm. um, in the basic sciences um, uh, departments. Um, so I co-direct a class on quantitative image analysis for biologists. Um, it's a half semester class. And, you know, I uh, co-teach it with somebody else. So, you know, that's as far as mm -hmm. courses go, it's pretty light. Uh, um, and for me, this is fine because, um, you know, as much as I like teaching, like teaching in a classroom, um, that if you want to do it well, takes a lot of time, a lot of preparation. And, um, you know, I, I take it seriously. So when I do it, I want to do it well. Um, and, you know, that would mean spending a huge amount of time preparing for that. And that's time that is taken away from me doing research, which is my main passion. So for me, this kind of arrangement is fine um, because the research part is the part that I am most excited about. And I am happy that I can contribute to some extent to teaching, um, uh, but that's not something that I want to do as a predominant thing. I, I can answer from an engineering school perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and I think fairly common across uh, most uh, schools is um, a nine-month appointment where 75% then of salary support <coughs> is based on teaching mm -hmm. and also advising like undergraduates mm -hmm. and uh, master students um, on curriculum and, and things. Um, some of that's administrative, but I'm sure you also have some administrative yeah. things as well that's yeah, going to happen sure. with regards. But, yeah. um, and then a common teaching load. So I, I uh, in a common year, I will teach one undergraduate course. Uh, and one graduate course. Um, the graduate course usually being in an area of interest, research interest, so I've taught tissue engineering. I think this spring will be the ninth time I've taught this course. So, <laughs> um, so I think your point point is well taken on, on the time that can go into some of this some of these courses. Um, often the first or second course you teach, I think it takes the, the longest oh, amount of time yeah. to develop that course. Uh, and then usually you're kind of running with that course. So. I hope they never take my tissue engineering course away from it because uh, it's a nice one to teach. And you hope you can update it uh, routinely, but um, but yeah, so that's kind of the teaching teaching load. So maybe Nate, um, since you just started, did you develop your own course or did you start with an undergraduate course? Did you get released when you started? Or did you get released? Yeah. So I, I got a I got a year of teaching release. I taught in my first semester. I would recommend teaching in your first semester because it's going to be slow getting your lab set up, ordering equipment. So you might as well take the teaching release when everything is up and running. Um, I developed a, a new course that's a graduate mixed, mixed with undergrad course in biomaterials. But um, uh, my former mentor, uh, Kevin Healy, and also Don Elbert, who used to be here, were really generous. and providing me all their notes. Um, but even with all their notes, um, teaching it for the first time, the, the number that, that someone told me that ended up being true is that for about every hour of active lecturing, it was about 10 to 12 hours of prep. So it was an enormous time commitment the first time. I taught this same course this last semester, and I spent about a third of that time um, revising the lectures and even though I spent a lot less time, the quality was a lot better this time. I'm sure Jason's class the ninth time is fantastic. Um, <laughs> it's, it's an amazing class. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and then next semester, they're going to have me teaching la uh, lab course. Um, the situation we have here, which may be similar at other places, is the really heavy lecturing courses like undergraduate physiology those are courses that they only give to people once they're tenured, so associate level and up, um, with the idea being that as an assistant professor, even with that nine months of salary support, our primary job is the research and getting the funding to do the research and run the lab. I, I'll just say that's great that they do that for you. That's not always the case. Um, 
where I've, I've had postdocs go into faculty positions and they're teaching large, rigorous courses <laughs> their first semester. Um, so that's something to think about in negotiation and mm -hmm. as you're moving towards there is specifically what are you teaching and mm -hmm. when are you teaching that? Mm -hmm. so. Teaching really you you really you still get your salary, but you don't teach. Just for a semester or for a year? Um, we get a year here, so within your first seven years, you know, pre tenure, you get two semesters of release. In engineering. In engineering, it, I'm sure it's different in other schools. Yeah, ours is, for example, one semester. I got one semester uh, off from teaching. Uh, but when I was doing that, I was uh, organizing the graduate seminars. So, uh, um, but I recommend everyone exactly what uh, Nate was saying. Like first semester, you really want to teach. Um, I mean, I was lucky I had my lab ready, uh, but still like uh, you really don't want to buy anything immediately because uh, they have generally year-end sales, so you can get very good discounts for large equipment. Uh, so you, uh, it takes some time to build up your lab, and it's better to teach immediately and then take your semester, if it's a semester or a year afterwards. Um, but in my case, it was uh, one semester. Um, and, and, and also one other thing that, uh, that Jason mentioned is, it's exact, or Nate also mentioned is, it's not necessarily... Um, uh, con uh, it's say same for every uh, school and also department because I have people from other departments let's say mechanical engineering they are teaching two plus one um, but for me it is one plus one when I say one plus one it's actually two courses a year um, but people were teaching three courses a year in other departments so it is good to uh, and that is determined by your department so you need to negotiate with your department but not just with the chair because Chairs do change, so you need to have it written, uh, though, so then it will be, you know, um, like honored afterwards if there's a change. Yeah. Maybe maybe one other comment I can make is um, also teaching is valued very differently at different institutions, um, and you might pick a, a career that's um, meant to be really about teaching. Uh, so one of my former PhD students is now at an undergraduate teaching institution, and so. Uh, it's really focused on teaching. Others have gone to places where maybe the teaching load is more, but then the expectations are that you do well at teaching. Uh, so that ratio of research and teaching might depend on uh, the university or the, the, the school that you might apply to. So think, consider that when you're considering institutions. Maybe a follow-up question on that. So, so what is negotiable, negotiable um, during that process in terms of what you were just talking about? Um, Regarding teaching or just in general? General teaching, okay. research, release, and yeah. It probably also depends on med school versus engineering department, so it would be good, I guess, to mm -hmm. hear some what you went through. <laughs> Been a while since. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, mean, I mean, I think pretty much everything is negotiable, or at least you should take it as such and try to negotiate. Um, um, startups are negotiable for sure um, and you should make sure um, when you're negotiating your startup that your needs are met that you are given the resources that are set set you up for success right um, otherwise you know you're um, starting off at a disadvantage so of course you know be reasonable think about what you need um, uh, but uh, don't be shy asking for what you need. Um, so do, um, and, you know, I mean, we haven't talked so, so far about, you know, gender differences and things like that, but I feel like women especially are, are much uh, uh, not as aggressive or, you know, uh, not as good as men in, in, in uh, bringing these things to the table. Um, maybe uh, women are more, um, you know, accepting sort of <laughs> whatever is given to them. So I think, um, you know, there are some gender differences there. And it's important to know that these things are negotiable and you should um, um, ask for what you need. I, yeah, I, I agree. I think, you know, again, everything's, you can negotiate. Um, I guess one suggestion I always 
you know, so I've gone through this with trainees who are negotiating positions, you know, talk to young faculty in those programs. Um, I caution, you know, don't try to negotiate, like, I'll only come here if I don't have to teach for the first three years. You're going to build resentment amongst yeah. the faculty who are then taking a burden because you're, so I think look at what's normal, what's typical, and, and be comfortable with that. But mm -hmm. I think you have to understand what, what others have gotten. I mean, they're maybe not the dollar amounts and things. Mm -hmm. um, and then for the, the dollar amount for startup, you know, I think, and it's being realistic with what do you need. Yeah. Don't ask for something right. ridiculous <laughs> sure. um, yeah. because, uh, you know, it's got to it's got to meet in the middle sometime. But uh, but I do think negotiating is important. Mm -hmm. I don't think I negotiated anything. You know, but, <laughs> uh, that was my own fault. But uh, you know, I think uh, it's an op it's the, it's the, really the only opportunity to do it is right uh, at the startup stage, um, at least for your assistant professor career. Murad or Nate, do you have anything to add to that? Or I, I guess I can say one more thing that like, when I started, I didn't really uh, uh, know that I should pick a class to start with. So if you don't do that, then you are kind of like, you know, like they give you whatever they want. Uh, of course, con considering your background, uh, but because because I didn't really say, oh, I really want this particular course. So I end up ch teaching it in my first uh, two years, like different courses every semester. So it was kind of a difficult uh, situation for me. Um, so I also recommend you like pick at least one or two courses uh, and usually like if these courses have multiple sections they have a course coordinator um, uh, and you know like, if you can put your name like as an expert and be the course coordinator I think it is better to be than you will be teaching that course um, at least like uh, for good amount of time so it's good really good to know that what you are teaching um, and similar to uh, Jason, I, I'm also doing like one undergrad and one graduate course. And and uh, and, and then you know, because I didn't pick up any courses that were available, so it was kind of difficult for me to come up with these courses. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second thing for the negotiations is uh, sometimes um, if you put like generic uh, uh, equipment, uh, they might come back to you and say, oh, we already have that in X's lab or Y's lab. And that's the easiest way for a dean to reduce your cost. Uh, and then you believe that, oh, that's great, so I can use that. Uh, but then the problem is once you start, for example, using one equipment uh, like you know, twice or three times a week, then it becomes a problem with the other faculty. I mean, it might be difficult for everywhere, but if you put something like that, you really need to, when they come to you, you really need to say, I really need this particular item in my lab because I'm going to be using it day and night. And then in that case, they will pay for it. But, but if you are like, oh, yeah, if they have that, then it is fine, then, then you're definitely going to lose that money. Um, and for example, in my case, I, I had the liquid nitrogen uh, storage for the cells and also a big centrifuge. And they say that, oh, there is one that I can do, uh, but then it ended up being like uh, the centrifuge wasn't working at all. And then the liquid nitrogen was so small, I couldn't use. You can see it, but you, you have to make sure that it's working and you can have the access. So those things are a little bit important, I think. Like you should really say, hey, I really need that in my lab because I'm going to be using it a lot. And then you can get over with that, uh, that reduction in your startup package. Yeah. I'm curious um, for all of the professors in the audience, um, when you initially start your lab, what are the, the first folks, like in terms of personnel, who are you most interested in kind of starting your lab with? A lot of folks argue about lab managers, research techs versus students versus undergrads versus postdocs. So I'm always kind of curious to see like where did you start your lab and how did that work? I guess I did this twice, <laughs> and I made <laughs> the same. same or no, it's in. Um, so I, yeah, I started in Spain, and then I relocated, and I had to, you know, I brought two people with me here, but I had to sort of build up again. Um, and both times, I, I have to say, for me, uh, it was very important, and I made the same choice to get somebody highly qualified um, technician. Um, who is going to help you set up the lab, help you get uh, everything up and running, 
um, they cost you money. <laughs> so, you know, it's not, I'm not talking about an undergrad who is going to come and like wash, uh, you know, flasks and, you know, make media, but I'm talking about somebody um, who is very experienced, highly qualified. For me, that was very important in both cases in uh, getting things up and running, also knowing, um, so in both cases, um, when I was in Spain, I, I hired someone with Spanish background. When I came here, I hired actually someone who was already here at UPenn, kind of knowing the culture, knowing you know, how to order things, um, you know, how to negotiate with the, with the vendors. Um, and that for me was quite, um, uh, I mean, in the end it worked out, it was a good strategy. I, again, have to pay higher amount of salary for this type of uh, position, but it was worth the money. Maybe yeah. you want to on Yeah, I, I started with um, a, a full-time technician and a, a couple of grad students. When you're, when you're starting off, it's very, very hard to get a postdoc with the relevant experience to want to come to a brand new lab. But you, you can get really talented technicians that can really help get things started. I guess for me, I, I started with three PhD students. Um, <laughs> so uh, to me, I think, and I think it's, some of this is the nature of work that each group does. And um, for me, it was really important to get PhD students that were gonna be around for a number of years. Um, so that that first year, although we didn't have a, a real lab the first year um, and first few years, um, I was working directly with them and training them on things that I knew how to do well. Um, I don't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. My lab won't let me. No. Um, <laughs> but then, you know, I think then that builds um, memory into things in the group. And so then, you know, Darren, Cindy, Jamie taught then Josh, who is the next PhD student, who taught, you know, the Ross and Sudir, you know. And so then a lot of that technology gets transferred down. Um, but I think it depends on the nature of the work. Yeah. So we, we didn't have cell cultures. You right. know, I know Nate, Nate does all this work with IPSC cultures and like you need someone who's, who's just mon managing that or animal colonies. Right. Yeah. Uh, since we don't do that kind of work, it, it, that didn't make as much sense yeah. for our lab. Yeah, I mean, so yeah, just to follow up on that, you know, when I started my lab the first time around, I built our microscope, right? And this is something I knew how to do. I knew I could do that. Um, but there, our, our work is very multidisciplinary and we also have to have cell culture, molecular cloning. And I was, you know, I, I have a vague idea of how that is done, but I wouldn't be the one, you know, teaching the students or doing the work in my lab. So I really needed somebody who was really good at that, um, who not only would teach the people, but also sort of like back them up and, and uh, maybe get these things started really fast. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so, you know, I, I did um, just very similar to you, train my people and work with them in the lab in the very beginning, hands-on, you know, building microscopes, et cetera. Right. But um, based on sort of like my background and skills and, you know, supplementing for the other things. So. Yeah. <laughs> So in terms of the earlier stages of your faculty career, are there like any main lessons you learned in terms of grant writing or mistakes that you thought you made that you could, would be good for postdocs maybe to know it? Who wants to start? <laughs> Morad, do you want to start? Sorry, the, 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 it was a little bit quieter, so can you repeat the question so I can... <laughs> <laughs> usually, usually it's quite coming up over there, and I am trying to guess the questions from the answers. But when you tell me directly, then I couldn't figure out what's the question. <laughs> yeah, no problem. I'll ask it again. Uh, I just asked in terms of grant writing and for younger faculty, are there any um, major lessons that you had to learn or mistakes that you made that you would uh, think be useful for postdocs to learn about? <clears throat> yeah, so that is, you know, um, I was very fortunate because I went to this, um, the, this, the center at Rutgers and I was on soft money and literally like, you know, um, 
like I, I was writing grants all the time and I learned like how to write grants to DOD, NSF, NIH, they are all very different. Um, so I, it, it is really like there is no uh, easy solution to learn these, but um, I recommend uh, they generally have like webinars, for example, for NSF and DOD and also uh, I'm not sure about NIH, I'm sure they do have to. It's good to just, uh, and they, they generally uh, put the links, you don't have to uh, uh, attend it live, you can watch it always, what they are looking for. Um, but usually they are very generic, that helps you not to make any errors, because you can make errors too. Um, uh, but uh, but I think it is like you, you learn it as you uh, write it. So uh, I tell all the new faculty that's joining, uh, although I am, I'm junior too, but I'm, I have three years of experience. So I, I tell them, hey, if you have some ideas, don't, uh, uh, don't uh, sit on it, you know, like like a chicken sitting on an egg. It's not gonna grow. You need to send and get reviews as soon as possible. Um, and even if you make mistakes, you learn in the process. Uh, because you take an NSF grant and try to send it to NIH or an NIH to NSF, one of NSF is gonna say, oh, it's not fundamental, it's too much application, they are gonna directly reject it. And if you do the same on the other side, they are gonna say, oh, what is the big question? What is the application? So in order to do those, uh, you can, uh, there are two ways. Either you can uh, find some uh, good mentors within the department. Uh, this is, of course, after you start, uh, who is writing these and, and talk with them. Uh, and the other thing that you could do is you can basically currently right now in your lab uh, while you are a postdoc or, or a student, you can actually try to learn these things. So in that sense, for example, you know, like uh, uh, I, in my case, for example, Jason used to share some of his grants and we used to discuss those things in my, you know, like uh, kind of the end of my postdoc time, uh, closer to. Um, you can always ask your advisor about that too and try to learn uh, learn those. Um, you know, kind of one, I guess an experience that I had was um, I'd written some fellowships for postdoc that were funded and then when I was a postdoc with my PI, I had written a large part of an R01, so a large NIH grant, uh, and that was funded right away. And then, <laughs> then I started my position, and I'm like, I'm gonna write an R01 like my first year, and so I put together this big big grant, and um, you know, didn't show it to anyone, didn't get input, because you know, I, was, I was able to get these grants funded. Um, <laughs> submitted it, and it just got torn up, and um, you know, realized quickly that you have to understand the process um, much better than I did uh, at the time. You know, your postdoc's uh, advisor's name might go further than your junior, you know, new faculty member's name. Um, and so I learned through a lot of failed grants. And, um, you know, I think that's that's always hard as an assistant professor, but you just keep putting them in and uh, you learn. Um, I, we, you know, I wrote grants with colleagues, but we never shared aims or anything with senior senior faculty. And that would be my recommendation: is you know you have to do it well in advance, which I think is the challenge. Most of us are doing these last minute, but uh, actually just sharing it with colleagues. And I've I've reviewed you know aims for my previous trainees to give some input, and uh, the more input you get, the, the better. Um, the other thing is to get on some grant panels as soon as you can. Uh, NSF allows very junior faculty to be on panels. NIH is a little bit more, um, you, you need to be a little bit further along to get um, on an NIH panel, um, at least a, a, maybe a standing panel. Um, but I learned so much by reviewing, sitting on these panels and learning about what people think are important. So things that I probably didn't think were that important about certain details, you know, you learn very quickly that people will focus on those and that's, it's important to kind of understand that. Um, so you learn by doing, but but you know use the resources you have. Yeah. So when you're first starting your lab, you have all these things to do. Would you recommend actually trying to get the, some preliminary research done for these grants, or just write those grants and spend that first year kind of writing a bunch of grants? Uh, Are you just I both? I <laughs> so you know. There are different types of grants. There are foundation grants that you may be able to go in right away and, you know, 
maybe based on your CV, your trajectory, et cetera, have some chance of getting, you know, they're always highly competitive, but maybe with less preliminary data um, and then build up to sort of like a more NIH type grant uh, with that funding. Um, I mean, you know, you have your startup funding when you first start, right? So. I would say probably prioritize getting projects up and running, you know, having that first publication um, as, as your sort of like first priority. Um, and, you know, uh, but then don't wait until like you're going to be up for tenure to start applying for grants. So there's kind of a critical period where data is coming together, you have enough preliminary data, you think, you know, uh, you have a, a great idea, then just like start um, writing and applying um, because it, it's going to take time. That's what I learned. So don't be discouraged when your first grant comes back and is not funded. Um, um, you know, it's easy to take these things um, hard um, and uh, be, be disheartened, but it happens to everyone. Um, just keep, you have to keep trying and it's going to take a few rounds. Um, so give yourself that sort of like time, right? Um, so don't apply in your seventh year uh, when you're up for tenure. And there's many young investigator grants, you know, that have timelines. Right. Um, right. So the, the, most of exactly. the first grants that, except for this yeah. very, very failed R01, uh, most of the first grants were young investigator ones that maybe you had to be within your first three years. Right. So take advantage of any of, of those. those. Yeah. Um, so don't let time, time pass by, yeah. Um, yeah. but then build those bigger grants through doing preliminary yeah. work in your first years. And I mean, even NIH has this early stage investigator right. status, right? And that's really important. So if you can, do take advantage of that. Um, it's, uh, you have to be within the first 10 years of your PhD. Um, so, you know, we had a question when we first started about how long should you be a postdoc. Do keep that in mind because you do have these uh, early stage investigator status, et cetera, that unfortunately run out and they're often measured with respect to your PhD um, the, when, when you received your PhD. Um, and uh, being eligible for these things is, makes things um, easier. I have a question kind of along the same lines about so if you want to get these grants, you need to be publishing something, I would imagine. In your first couple of years, you know, does it make sense to, like, how do you decide if you should publish something that's maybe a little more incremental and not a really big story, or should you save everything you're working on to publish some really big story? And, you know, that's a big gamble. I mean, I, I just wonder what your thoughts are on that. Um, I mean, I, I always say go for high impact, you know, I mean, this is sort of uh, my philosophy. Of course, different people have different strategies and, you know, I don't have any kind of um, data on what works and what doesn't work. Uh, my philosophy has always been if I can go after something that is higher impact, that's what I should be doing. But I do agree with you that, you know, they do, they do look at productivity um, and, you know, publishing a high impact paper can, can take a long time, even when your story is ready and you submit, right? It can take several rounds of revision. So something to maybe keep in mind nowadays, bioarchive is a very potentially good um, way of getting your work out there even before it is published to tell, I think grant reviewers do take note of that um, and to tell them that you're being actually productive, you have this story that is, you know, maybe undergoing revisions, it's not published yet, uh, but it is on, there is a preprint available on BioArchive. I think reviewers do look at that, so that's something to, to, to consider. I, I always recommend, um, you know, do, do both in a way yeah. where, because um, I think there's, there's your grants, it really helps to, if the reviewers see that you publish something, it mm -hmm. means, you have the capability to do work and get it out there. Um, and then promotion, you know, some of the, those who I think have had challenges with promotion, um, they didn't publish, they're in fields where it takes six years to develop a paper, they haven't published, so then 
you know, what's a letter writer write about? Mm -hmm. Some paper that might be just coming out. Mm -hmm. I think BioArchive helps this a lot in mm -hmm. certain fields mm -hmm. because they know there's activity. Mm -hmm. You also want to make sure you can get out and present your work. Your, your trainees mm -hmm. can present their work. So mm -hmm. whether if you're holding back a big story, I think mm -hmm. that can slow down that process. Mm -hmm. You need to get your brand out there. You need people to know who you are. Yeah, and, sure. um, so I think it's about picking both, you know, many, uh, many of our fields, um, there's really interesting things that you can do that don't take as long to do. You know, I think you can balance that out with these bigger stories mm -hmm. that will take a, a long time. <laughs> um, I think uh, one thing yeah, that I would like to add, if I can, is well because I I can also speak uh, uh, on behalf of Jason because I was in his lab when he was a, a, a assistant professor then he become associate and he become a full faculty I was there all the time uh, during that time so so I can see, so I I can definitely tell you you know like at the beginning and that's what I'm trying to do in my lab too that you know like you really need to get papers out uh, uh, and. And, and I'm not saying, of, of course, everybody has certain uh, kind of uh, quality, right? So they are generally good, good quality papers, but it doesn't have to be very high impact because uh, I remember, you know, like from my recollection that maybe Jason will remember that too. You know, we were sending very good papers uh, to very good journals, but then we were getting like rejections by saying that, oh, this is too biology. Oh, this is really out of our scope, like not really... Uh, especially like for advanced materials or like more like uh, and, and even like we sometimes we're waiting very long time for nature materials and stuff and then we were kind of like reducing it to uh, let's say PNAS and then reducing it to advanced and then reducing it to biomaterials like that was for example my first uh, paper with J like one of the tissue engineering papers with Jason but when you're a junior faculty you know like and he has a very big group in, in that time so if you have a couple people, you really don't want to wait for that because even if you have a very strong paper, it is really it can be a nature paper or a nature materials paper. Maybe you would never be able to get it because you are just a junior faculty in uh, and they don't know your name. So you know uh, there is definitely some kind of a bias too. So I wouldn't I wouldn't wait for for a very long time. It's good to keep publishing. Um, that that's that's actually my my point. Yeah. And, and I, I also recommend that, you know, editors are not these, like, people who are not unreachable or, you know, unavailable. They go to conferences, so try to get yourself invited or go to conferences, present your work, and do meet editors and talk to them because, you know, you can write a cover letter and submit your paper, but the best pitching you can do is in person. So, and, and people do that all the time. Um, and so don't be shy meeting editors and pitching your, your idea and work to them. I think there's a lot of new mechanisms, right, for some of these larger journals where you can do this, like, pre-submission stuff. Mm -hmm. have, you, have you found that this has been helpful or successful? You mean, like, a pre-submission inquiry? Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't find those super useful because, um, and, and I had one editor explain it to me once, that a full submission is going to get her full attention and she's going to spend an X amount of time reading that paper and, you know, um, understanding it. Whereas a pre-submission inquiry is going to be a glance, right? So she's going to cite based on a glance and, you know, uh, you may get, you um, um, a rejection, but maybe if you submitted a full paper and she put or he put her full attention to it, then they would have been more excited about it. So I don't find that super useful. I say that if you have a full story written, just submit it. Yeah. Yeah. I I told many of these guys I gave up on the pre-submissions because <laughs> I think it's very easy to say no to a right to a pre-submission, to a pre-submission, but if they have the full story. The worst case is it just takes reformatting and things. Right. You know? um, but I think it's much easier to see the full story. Um. And one other one other uh, strategy that you can do is uh, most of the good journals, um, like good good impact high impact journals, do like special uh, issues. And usually, uh, you know, these are uh, you you may know the guest editors or you may know some of the contributors that they can also recommend you for those. Uh, I mean, it's not a guaranteed publication, but, but but when you have a deadline 
for a, for a, for a publication, it, it definitely motivates uh, your students. So if you say, hey, like we have a chance to publish in this journal, but the deadline is that, it definitely motivates. It makes things like going much faster. So I, I recommend that too. That really depends on your network. So you need to do some networking and get invited in, in those. Great. Thank you so much. So it's already 3 p.m. Um, thank you all so much for, for attending and um, for the others asking the, the questions. And I think trainees really, really appreciate your input. So thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, thank you for inviting yeah, us.